Welcome to Inspiring End of Life Conversations with Nina Impala. Do you have questions about death? How about events surrounding death? Or perhaps you have questions that need to be answered after death. On this program, we talk frankly and openly about the subject and invite you to share your comments and experiences as well. Now, here is your host, Nina Impala. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inspiring and Life Conversations. I am here with Father Nathan, and I'm going to give a little background for those of you that are new to his show. So he's originally from Groves, Texas. He graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio and entered the Dominican Order in 1979. He received an MA and a Master's in Divinity from the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and served in-campus ministries in California and Arizona for 27 years. He was pastor and director of the Catholic community at Stanford University and also at the All Saints Catholic Newman Center at Arizona State University. He's chaired the executive board of the Catholic Campus Ministry. He is the author of In Toto Two, The Wizard of Oz, as a spiritual adventure, great book, and his other book, Afterlife Interrupted, Helping Stuck Souls Cross Over. He loves golf and spending time with his friends. The one thing about Father Nathan that is so amazing is that over the past 22 years, Nathan says he's helped at least 250 people who died suddenly adjust to the afterlife. These victims of fires, automobile accidents, shootings, stabbings, and drownings came to him in his dreams, seeking help for resolving their uninterrupted death experiences. And although such contact with the other side was not something he sought out, Father Nathan has come to believe that providing such help is something the Holy Spirit has given him to do. And I'm kind of thinking, Father Nathan, it's well over 250 now. I was just thinking that too. Why don't you put 300 on there? (laughs) Easily. Yes, easily. So we we, uh, welcome you to the show. We have so much to talk about today because uh, as of right now, you're on a writing retreat. I am. I'm, uh, it's kind of a combination of uh, vacation and writing retreat. I'm in Sedona, Arizona, which is known as a kind of spiritual uh, a place for a lot of different kinds of people. But yes. it, was, it was within a drive from um, my residence in Tucson. And in COVID times, you know, you can be in your own little bubble. So yes. we're staying safe and oh. and writing another book. That's great. That's great. And, and you know, this um, this month, we've had a lot of content. You've had a lot of activity going on. And what I want to talk about today, there's a couple things. We've got a lot to cover here, but one of the things I want to talk about in your series that you do, your webinar, which hopefully is going to be on YouTube for everybody um, soon, is that I love what you say, that partnership is important in the kingdom of God, unity and community. It's natural to rely on one another. And this is kind of like to me, this is kind of like the topic for the whole show today is about being in unity and relying on one another because clearly all of these people that you have helped cross are like a, a club for you. They've become your friends and they're very present in your life. Many of them are. There's some who um, don't really stay. Uh, I wouldn't really call them friends. We had a, a moment where I helped them. Uh, do an important life task, and sort of like in the ministry, there are people that you, that you just become friends with, and they stay friends for life, and then others sort of move through. But right now, I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who want to help with this new book. And you definitely are. are. You definitely are. I've been reading a lot of the things that you've sent me, and I just I can't even believe. You know, it's like I feel like I'm I'm with this extended family of yours talking with them when I'm reading the content that you sent me. Yeah, they can be great fun. Yes, they can. And you know, I I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about thing. So what I found in all of my readings this week with you was the fact that there's a time to pause and go deeper. And I was wondering if you could explain that to everyone what that actually means. Yes. You know, we, when I'm with a prayer partner and we're, we're working with the dream content, the, the content comes in a dream, usually someone showing me uh, some violence associated with their death. Yeah. And we get, we get with a prayer partner, say our protective prayers. And then um, it's usually I who allow them to move through me in speech. Sometimes once in a while, my prayer partners also have that facility. 
Uh, but usually it's moving through me. And if they're inside me and we're kind of like at the front, we're only in the first two minutes of the show. We're kind of breezy right now. Right. Uh, as we move in more deeply, we might touch upon more emotional content. Okay. And it, it's almost like leaning in in a conversation. Yeah. I would say that's a good way to do it. And it's almost like if, if uh, on this plane, if, if I had to tell you something really important or there was something that I knew I might get emotional about, I would say, give me a minute. You know, or when people's eyes well up, that's kind of what I get. You know, when people start to talk and they start to feel emotion. And, right. And they, there's a physics to it also that, okay. um, that has something to do with apparently, I think with wavelengths, okay. you know, uh, you, I think your listeners probably know that it isn't really woo woo to, to, to know of ourselves that we are, um, that we're an energy field. Yes. Uh, quantum physics tells us that. Yes. And that our energy uh, on the one hand is similar because we're both human. It's all so distinct like our fingerprints. Yes. And this this brings me to this wonderful story that we're going to tell uh, today with um, Daniel. Daniel is very, very excited about helping you with your book. Yes, I, he is. I, he is he's thrilled and Daniel is here. I know he's here. I can feel him. And he's, he's excited that we're talking about him today and sharing his story. And why don't you just give us a little brief background to how Daniel died? And then I've got some questions for you about that. In the dream that he, when he entered my consciousness in, in sleep, this was several years ago, uh, I, was, I was a college student uh, at a, a fraternity event that was uh, not alcohol related. It was just a field day. Uh, this group had recently uh, welcomed new members. They hadn't yet started the pledge period that often involves some sort of hazing. Uh, this was just a fun day of athletic contests like sack races and different things like that where, that where teams were competing. They, they had to finish some task, grab a flag, and keep going on to the next thing. And one of the things was climbing a tree and grabbing a flag that was placed in it and coming back down and, and going on to the next. Well, he climbed the tree and the limb broke. Uh, and he fell something like 15 feet onto his chest, heard something break, and uh, couldn't catch his breath. Yeah. Uh, his body began to convulse. He was out of it. And he was, uh, he was just frightened people were screaming and uh, quarreling about whether to turn him over or not but, yeah. uh, and he he was already at a distance from his body and he just decided he didn't want to be where it was in the midst of all that uh, yeah. anger or confusion and, and so on and he allowed himself to watch them take his body uh, away to in, in a truck to try to and get he it. didn't want to go with it no, he didn't. He, he just said, why would I want to be him? He didn't, he didn't really, it wasn't so much that he was consciously choosing death. It's just that of the two options present to him in the moment, the one <laughs> he wanted the peaceful one. And it was scary for him to look at. That's what I got from all of his readings. It just like when it looked, he looked at himself, it was just like, why would I want to get back in that body? Yes, it was in convulsions. And yes. uh, he just opted to uh, stay where it was peaceful and his guardian angel was with him. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, then eventually the scene uh, moved away from him. They, they gathered up. It was a shock to everyone. They quickly gathered up their things and went back to campus and to the hospital or later after his death to uh, authorities. Uh, and he just opted not to be a part of any of that. You know, this is one of the things that you say, for lack of a better word, was that wanting to, when we pray for people, we say rest in peace. And when someone dies traumatically, which is what you're witness to, you want now that that prayer means so much more to me now, wanting to rest in peace. And for Daniel, he was just like, I need to get out of here. This, this, I don't like the way this looks. I don't like the way this feels. This is too hard to see. And what took place after that, Father Nathan, which I, I love that we, we through several conversations, you kind of found out what, what he decided to do and how the angels or whoever he was with that was guarding him helped him to 
leave that spot because there was like question about, well, let me back up here. Many times, and you and I have talked about this before, that if, if someone dies or something horrific happens, even if you think of a war, the energy of the tragedy can linger in that space. And I know I've felt it before where I've gone through an intersection or something or um, I witnessed a man who got hit by a car one time. And every time you go through that intersection, for me, I know that something very bad happened there and sometimes I can still feel it. And so I guess my question is to you is for your next book, trying to get, Daniel's being very helpful with trying to give us information to help people understand that part. Boy, that was long-winded, Nina. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I'm your guest. I'll try to be real terse and talk in sound bites. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he, um, I, I've been a campus minister most of my life, and this young man died as, as a college student. So there was already a little affinity. And uh, he, had, uh, he was, had a kind of natural banter, even though he was in the process of doing this crossing over. Uh, he had a kind of natural banter about him, and he suggested to me, uh, that what if I was your intern? I know that you're thinking about writing another book, and last time you had one of the people in it, uh, one of their stories that they that you let them be uh, involved in the writing of the book. Would you let me do that in the next one? Wow! So yeah. um, he was he was funny about it because he was uh, he was uh, volunteering for a job. Yes, and uh, he he wanted to make it clear that he was going to he was going to stay a full time student in the afterlife. He really had a lot of things he wanted to learn, but he wanted to carve out some space to uh, intern with me. And he was so outgoing about it. You know, he's just a sweetheart. I, I, I love the guy. Uh, yeah. And he's already at work and he's very proud of uh, the association and excited about the task. It's something that he's never done. And he relishes doing new things. He said uh, in your last, uh, when you were getting permission from him, because Father Nathan gets permission from these people to, uh, to be able to talk about them. And he said, I, I heard I'm going to be on some radio show that he's on today, that he wants to talk about me on some radio show today, which I just thought was really great. And he, he really did a good description with, which gave me some clarity about what it meant for him not to leave that place. And one of the things that I find to be true with your people is that a lot of times what's going on on this plane, they can just transition that to the afterlife. So he's what a their surroundings end up being in the afterlife. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of how he, he even thought that maybe he spent the night where he died energetically. Is, do yeah, I have that right? My sister's helping me. She's my editor and publisher, and mm-hmm. she read what uh, the documents that I, I, I get all these things recorded and transcribed. All these correct. Yep. And she said I wasn't clear on whether he's actually stayed in that real field for years and years, right. or whether he kind of whether it morphed into an afterlife scene that included uh, the I don't know the picture of the field or or some you know hologram of it. So uh, he uh, he sort of apologized and said, yeah, you know, I was pretty hazy and <laughs> when all that yeah. was going on and I wasn't really very clear. And he said, I'm really not exactly sure, but I've been told that I stayed there for some hours and maybe even overnight. And then my guardian suggested, if you're finding this peaceful, there's another way we could do this. We could bring this with us to a better place. Yeah. I, I just, that was really um, interesting because I can imagine, you know, if, there was trauma with the death. It's just, to me, it's like they always make it okay. It's, it's like you, you, you can kind of just say what you need to say, and they kind of make it happen for you, the guardians. Well, he was funny about it. He said, you know, it's not like I got so familiar with that field that I knew every ant in it. Oh, you know? <laughs> that's right. He did say that. He, he, uh, say- he said, I, you know, I knew there were seasons that were changing, but I didn't get a sunburn, and I didn't sit in the snow. <laughs> yeah, he said it was, you know, he goes, it wasn't unpleasant. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't unpleasant. That was the one thing he kept saying over and, I think and over. I called it vague. Yeah. Yep. And yes, that but was it a good was peaceful, And peace is what he needed. Yeah. So he was in a peaceful place and it was providing that. And there it is, that rest in peace place, because they've been through trauma. 
You and then there came it. a point at which he didn't need that any longer and was ready to leave it behind and go on to something else. Yes. That's the whole point of sleep, isn't it? Right. It's nice yeah. to go to sleep and have a good night's sleep, but that's so you can get up in the morning full of and energy. Take that, and take that break. Yeah, yeah he, he's, he's very excited about working with you, and I think that he's going to be right by your side the whole time. He seems right. to be really excited about able to help other people and make other people feel better if someone died tragically like that. Yeah. You know, and the people that came to get him, weren't they other fraternity guys from that maybe from that same college, but years and years ago? Yeah, he explained that, you know, like a lot of organizations that cool. get the, in the lobby, there's some sort of hall of history, including the founders. Yes. You know, dressed in period clothes and, you know, looking, you know, you know, like an old photographs. The person who came for him was one of the founders of his fraternity from like back in the 1910s or 20s. Yeah, school was just so important to him. And and what's so beautiful and what I, I really love reading about Daniel is he's creating that in the afterlife and even more so by helping you write a book. <laughs> that's just the, that's so great. And you've got uh, several others that are going to be helping you write a book. What is the total number of people you think that are going to be? Uh, well, I'm not sure yet. I've already got about eight. Uh, and, and as you just mentioned, I only tell people stories with their permission, and I'm not finished the permission asking part yet. Okay, that's I'm fine. two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through it, but that's that's my method. I have stories that I would like to share, but mm-hmm. I need to. And there's one that I want to share that I can't share. But it's just too recent. Okay. The no, it's fine. Involved. That could Mead next month's show, but he just, he, he, he died a tragic death, he said, but it was just a death. It is just so sweet the way he moves on and opens up with different people. What we'll do is, I know we're getting close to break already. Um, We will go to break and when we get back, we will talk, we're going to talk a little bit more about your friends that are helping you and about one story that we do get to share that's pretty new. Okay. So we'll be right back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Nina offers an alternative to traditional counseling. Sessions are not just 50 minutes, but a full hour. When you go in for a regular counseling session, many times you don't remember everything. Nina's difference is a summary email after each session and or a follow-up phone call if needed up to two weeks after. Nina also provides hospital visit consultations as necessary. Sessions with Nina and Paula are $250. And if you book a three-session package, you will get a $100 discount. Let's get you feeling peaceful and happy again. Losing someone we love is one of the most challenging, fearful, and heart-rending experiences we are ever likely to face. In her book, Dearly Departed, Nina Impala shares stories of her experiences as a hospice volunteer for more than 12 years and how those experiences prepared her for the final days of her own parents. Nina emphasizes the importance of being a good listener and living a good life. Dearly Departed by Nina Impala is available in paperback or Kindle edition through Amazon.com or your favorite book retailer. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Inspiring End of Life Conversations. If you have a question for Nina Impala or her guest today, call into our program at 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to tutoringforthespirit at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. Okay, and we're back with Father Nathan you know, Father Nathan, I've really enjoyed talking about Daniel, and I want to just mention one last thing he said was that he was, he was so excited about college and all these wonderful things that were happening in his life. And this is what I love about 
perfect young man is what he's creating in heaven or in the afterlife, I should say, what he's creating in the afterlife. He says, remember, you left behind a bunch of things, but you didn't leave creating a future behind. Yes. And that that's such an important, it's very important for this show. It's important for my audience that death is not the end. And right. that is one of the beautiful things that we're learning through Father and people, and especially people that died tragically, how much we're learning. And is this pretty much what your new book's going to be covering, just more and more different parts of this, Father we're Nathan? Tra- yeah, we're trying to look at specific things. Uh, for example, people ask about suicide. Yes. So I'm going to have a couple of stories of people that took their lives. Uh, one, uh, well, about things that make people get stuck, like um, – being overwhelmed. Is yeah. one. one of them, though, is simply not attending to your what your conscience tells you needs doing. You know, uh, wanting to avoid a life challenge that's come your way because it's too painful or difficult. So is that like not listening, you think, or being aware of your own life? Well, I think sometimes people move into alcohol or substance abuse sometimes because they know that there's a life challenge right in front of them, but they're, they're just hurt too much. Uh, okay. and, and it gets delayed or covered over. Uh, but eventually, I think we all have a certain amount of life tasks that need tending to. And uh, so I've got a couple of examples of people that are kind of now saying, hey, don't do what I did. <laughs> don't, it's not magic. Dying's not going to make it all better. Uh, mm. uh, dying solves some problems, but uh, there's still life tasks that need doing, and you'll 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 have the help you need if you ask for it. See, and that's what's so beautiful about the work that you do, and what I've noticed through every one of these people that you've shared with me is that no matter what the problem is, the guardian is there to help them through it. It's 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 kind of like. I, and there was another quote that you have, but it was it's kind of like in our own lives. You know, it's it's literally step by step and not getting too far ahead of yourself. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. Many times I was reading the content for this month, what I kept hearing or what I kept reading was just little things like, it's not time to do that yet, or it's not time to go there yet, or it's not mm-hmm. time to bring this in yet. So what? Okay, let's just wait. You know, where I think sometimes on the earth plane, maybe guardian angels around us all the time. Well, we do, but in a different way, we can't see them. Where it would be, um, I would say, avoidance, and yes. then comes in the, the drugs and the alcohol. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think that's something that we are seeing now without getting too much into it, you know, with our young people because they're bored, they're depressed, they're sad, they're lonely. And so, that's getting kicked up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, Father Nathan, I wanted to talk about uh, the new uh, gentleman, well, I don't know who he is, but the man that came my way named Naughty that you shared with me. Uh, yes. And a uh, really beautiful story. Why don't you tell us about Naughty, and then I will ask you some questions about that. He's, a, he's very recent. Uh, that He brought his story uh, to me about five weeks ago. Okay. Uh, in the dream, I felt like I was in the Middle East. I was mm-hmm. inside a bunker-like room, uh, and then there were there were shots outside. There was a big door that I went through into a space where people had been shot and were moaning, like, mm-hmm. like on the ground. Uh, and then there was a young girl pointing a gun at me, and I woke up. Okay. Um, it turned out that um, Naughty is just a, a very sweet soul of a devout uh, Muslim. I don't know when, whether he was Sunni or Shia, but that's, that's uh, what happened. He was caught in that clash of, uh, of uh, uh, violence between those sects. Uh, their mosque had already been destroyed. It was somewhere in Iraq. Uh, and so they were in a temporary quarters where they could pray, which Nadi had helped them find. Mm -hmm. But the men pray in one space and the women pray in another. Yes. And what happened that day was the people who um, ambushed them ambushed their women and kidnapped their their wives and daughters and 
when they heard the shooting, the men had to choose between whether to stay uh, hidden behind closed doors or to go out after to care for their women. Wow. And Adi was a, a husband and father. He he went out into the street, and there he was confronted by a young girl with a, a, a machine gun. But um, there were two uh, angry men who had Nadi's, uh, or at least another a woman and and the girl's sister, the mother, the girl's mother and sister, with guns pointed at them, and they told her, "You either pull you, your trigger or we pull ours." Wow. So uh, the little girl shot Nadi and killed him. Um, so he's been through that, but he was. He said, "I wasn't an imam, but I was an elder and a leader." And uh, many people died in that event. But after he crossed, um, he we asked permission to use the story, and I've uh, spoken to him since then. And uh, he's he's very interested in the mystery of all of it that he he was surprised that he, a Muslim, would be assisted by someone he called a Christian, a priest, and an American. Yes. Because he didn't have any, he didn't know anybody from those categories. Yes. And he said, but the reason I got shot at all was because people looked at me as a member of a category that was not them. Yep. And he said, "I, I get it now that, uh, that we all need to look at what we've been taught about ourselves uh, in rea- in reaction to others and be careful about what we believe and not believe. Right. Categories. Yes. Just like you were- people separating I- ideas about separation. Some of them are religious and, and others aren't. And then he was really excited about meeting angels. Uh, yeah. He said, I'd never thought about cross species communication i knew of all the other species i knew of we thought as is simpler than ourselves like goats or birds they, yes. they aren't verbal and they're not they're, they don't have intellects like we and he said now i'm dealing with angels who have both and they must look at me and see a simpler kind of being yes yeah he 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 sounds um so smart and he sounds very intrigued with what's happening to him. i was truly touched by um, when he talked about, and I'm actually grabbing um, what he was talking about uh, with the colors. He said, if you know our art, our moss often have elaborate mosaics, geometric color patterns. They've shown me a preview of these works of art that seem stationary. There are bits of colored stone cemented into place, but they, they're showing me a kaleidoscope. And then he says, do you know what this means? And as I was reading this, I was picturing all these beautiful colors in my own head. And I've always felt that we're seeing from the afterlife or some people that are in the afterlife are perceived through different colors. And when he talks about it, um, he said, we are made of light while in the earthly body. And that when we speak of someone being radiant, as a bride on her wedding day or a particularly loving, joyful elder grandmother, someone being radiant, that light comes out of them. That's what that means. And I think I'm, he, was, he thought maybe he was saying too much, but he was trying to explain to us what it's like to be seen as color. Yes. And he was surprised. I, I, at, while, while at Stanford, we didn't have our own Catholic center. We we were headquartered in an ecumenical center. Our daily mass was said in a chapel. As soon as we were finished on Fridays, the Muslims were on their way in to begin their prayers. Okay. And I and they used that chapel, because, and the chapel was designed in such a way that it had no representations of humans or angels. Because that, oh. that would be okay. offensive to Muslim sensibilities. It's considered, considered idolatry. Yes. And so that's what he was saying, that our mosques are decorated with bright colors, but they're geometric patterns. And he said, since I've been here, I've seen that the patterns were really the patterns of angels. That that they were, I didn't know that that I was surrounded by angels when I was in a mosque with these geometric patterns, but that's indeed what they are. Yes. And he he felt like, Yeah, and you could feel his excitement in it because he's figuring this out. 
Yes. And he was very excited about figuring it out. His death, though, was, it was, basically, it was a group. And so, many people were killed at the same time. Yes. It was interesting hearing him actually describe that and what actually came to get them was some kind of a, a barge. Yeah, I've seen this before, um, that lo- lots of times people that die in violent events end up in some sort of a place with other people who died similarly. And, and they don't really interact much. They just sort of cohabit in the same space. But it's, uh, it's not punitive, but it's not pleasant either. Yeah. Somebody, somebody compared it like sitting at a bus stop. Yeah. Um, and, and then in this field of people, today there's going to be movement, and anybody who's ready can get on board. And okay. some sort of conveyance comes for them. And this time it happened to be that the space – he explained that Iraq is between the two rivers, Tigris yes. and Euphrates, mm-hmm. and that it used to be called Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers. And that rivers uh, have a mystic uh, hold on the spiritual imagination of people from Iraq. The whole region mm-hmm. is dry, except these two rivers make it verdant. And so he said that when it came time for them to cross, the place began to fill with shallow water enough to float a barge. Mm -hmm. And then he explained festivals, Mm -hmm. like there would be a festival in the springtime with lots of blossoms. Mm -hmm. And then another one in the summer with fruits that ripen in the summer. Okay. I just had a peach earlier and that's a summer fruit. Then he said there might be another festival in the fall that celebrates harvest time and um, gratitude for abundance. Like Thanksgiving. And he said, these festivals all involve some sort of decorated floats. Mm-hmm. And our, oh, okay. people, our people are familiar with those. And so they're, they're showing us something that's familiar to us. And then different ones of them have relatives and loved ones of ours that are on them who are waving at us and, and inviting us to get on board. Oh, that's great. And he it's said his in- father came for him. Yes, I saw that, that his dad came for him. Yeah, that's I've seen great. this pattern. It, it, it isn't always barges, but some, something that moves around like that. One, one time it was a hayride. Mm-hmm. Uh, something gentle that moves and that's not difficult to climb on. Sometimes all you have to do is wave your hand and they'll like pull you as long as you indicate that you want to be pulled. Yeah. Nobody's made to go where they don't want to go. Uh, and they're also told that not everyone will leave today, but that's okay. They're not shamed. They're, they're just told there'll be another train coming. <laughs> you know, well, there'll, be, there'll be a yeah. next barge or something. You Don't can get work. on the next one. Yeah. He, um, I know, was he, what do you think that, you know, I mean, what he, he wanted to help with most in writing of the books? He's going to be one of your other people that's going to be helped with writing of your book, correct? Yes. Yes. He's already excited about it. You know, he talked a little bit about groups of people. And I, I, I kind of think this is an important thing to talk about. He said, I think in your American press, if there's something that happens somewhere around the world and 200 people died, they all always say, and among them were two Americans. It's sort of like that. So he's talking here about people and when people die and grouping them together. Again, we're getting into like different categories and stuff. He says, we keep going back to that idea that our own kind matters in a way that's larger than other kinds. And I would just like to be somebody who is, I've been drawn into your work, and so I would like to not only pass it through it briefly, but linger. And he goes on to say, and um, one of your prayer partners was there, and she said, we really appreciate that. But what I think he was trying to let us know is the importance of everything matters, like all of it matters together, Nathan. That's kind of what I felt from that. And that, you know, whether Muslim people are dying or whether it's two Americans, it's not just data. These are human people that have been loved. Yes. And he brought up COVID and the fact that there's an ongoing tally of how many people are dying. And he said, I'm a businessman and I've read, uh, you know, uh, balance sheets. Yeah. But remember, these are people and they're all grieved by someone who is losing a loved one. Yes. And, you know, the way that he put that, it's just very matter of fact, you know, because 
I don't know if, you know, after listening to the news, we get kind of desensitized to, you know, 20 people died today in Iraq due to a bombing or something like that. And it's, it's data. It's facts. Yeah. yeah. But it's almost like you have to take it a step further and go, oh, you know, you have to think about their families and people that love them that are going to be missing them. And I think sometimes we miss the mark on that. And I and also that, said that there are moments that all of us look up into a starry sky. Um, he mentioned a drop of blood that sometimes when you see blood, it reminds you that you bleed like everybody else does. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the, kind of the you, you know, and then he also mentioned the planet and said the planet also is suffering. It's overtaxed. People are pull, pulling out of it more than it can deliver. Anyway, he he has a really global consciousness, and I'm grateful to have him. Aboard. He did say that about the Earth. So I, it just it almost amazed me. Like they could feel in the afterlife, they're seeing the weight that is on our planet right now because it's yes. heavy. It's very yes. heavy. There's well, no lightness of ones here, and it's quite clear that he still cares about the earth and, and would like to be a helpful uh, change agent somehow, even after dying. I, yeah. And I just think that's so cool. And that is his way that I believe that he wants to help. And I know you've got a couple other people here that are, are coming in too, to want to help. And uh, it is time for our other break. So we'll come back and talk about that in just a few minutes. We'll be right back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Nina offers an alternative to traditional counseling. Sessions are not just 50 minutes, but a full hour. When you go in for a regular counseling session, many times you don't remember everything. Nina's difference is a summary email after each session and or a follow-up phone call if needed up to two weeks after. Nina also provides hospital visit consultations as necessary. Sessions with Nina and Paula are $250. And if you book a three-session package, you will get a $100 discount. Let's get you feeling peaceful and happy again. Losing someone we love is one of the most challenging, fearful, and heart-rending experiences we are ever likely to face. In her book, Dearly Departed, Nina Impala shares stories of her experiences as a hospice volunteer for more than 12 years and how those experiences prepared her for the final days of her own parents. Nina emphasizes the importance of being a good listener and living a good life. Dearly Departed by Nina Impala is available in paperback or Kindle edition through Amazon.com or your favorite book retailer. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Inspiring End of Life Conversations. If you have a question for Nina Impala or her guest today, call into our program at 1 888 346 9141. That's 1 888 346 9141. Or send an email to tutoringforthespirit at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. Okay, we're back with Father Nathan and all of these wonderful souls and we're talking a lot today about these people in the afterlife that are come to help Nathan write his second book. So Nathan, there's a couple other people that I want to touch on here. Um, one of them especially is uh, Brady. Yeah. And Brady talks a lot about trauma loop and I really want to get that out there because we suffer with that now I know in the afterlife is, in fact, he's probably not there right now, but he was for a little bit. And as we are on this side too, uh, trauma loops where people see something and it just keeps playing over and over again in the head. Yes, think- it's common um, for people that have been in war. A lot of PTSD sufferers have a scene in their head that they can't get over, some ghastly thing that happened on a battlefield, for example. Yes. Uh, People um, who have been sexually victimized, especially in childhood, 
mm -hmm. often will have a, some sort of repetitive loop in their mind about events that um, were an assault on their body. Um, the, the, and, and for some of my people, the trauma loop that they're in is the last thing they saw before they died. Yeah. And that was the case with Brady. He was in a car where the driver was driving unsafely enough that Brady just had buckled his seatbelt just moments before the crash. Mm -hmm. um, but his, the car, he was in the rear passenger seat and he was conscious that the car was going off the road sideways and that there was not a bumper or an engine between him and whatever it would hit. Wow. And he, the thing that he feared in that flash is exactly what happened. The impact was uh, hard and it was right where he was and it was unsurvival. Yeah. And he kept, and, and it involved tilting and going down an embankment. And so he, sometimes they compare it to being inside a washing machine or yeah. you know, a front loader, you know, something that's spinning round and round. Uh, a lot of people with, with uh, PTSD don't like going to sleep because they have relative control over their thoughts in the daytime, but they surrender that when they're unconscious. And then, you know, against their will, they have night terrors of, of these loops. Um, and they're hard to get rid of sometimes. Sometimes it can take quite a while. You need help. Yes. You just need uh, help. It's not something that you can do on your own. You need help to get rid of those trauma loops. Right. And whether you get it here or hereafter, it seems like one one Brady what Brady was saying was they they kept telling me you're really good at you already know how to do that you do it over and over and over again <laughs> you you really know how to stay in that trauma loop what we'd like you to do is come over here for a moment and do this for a little while you can go back to that trauma loop whenever you please but right yes. now we'd like you to come do this yes and they just kind of help his head a little bit that's kind of what I noticed and I yeah, really and then after a while it it begins to feel like you have volition you have choice. You can mm -hmm. either go back to the familiar trauma loop or you can spend more time doing uh, something else. Yeah, so so that, that was the kind of help he was getting to. A different, and he, he was a person who said that he mostly lived in the future. You know, okay. Do you know anybody like that? Yes, I do. If you're talking to one. <laughs> <laughs> I have to pull myself back into the present moment. I know, me too. My, me my too, thoughts are always racing ahead to the next thing I'm going to do. Uh, and something we have to talk to the celestial committee about someday. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, anyway, he he <laughs> he he had that all grooved in, in his lifetime. He and the fact that he was even in that car was because they were on a way to a ball game that he had bought the tickets for, and he had organized the whole thing. Otherwise, that it wouldn't have even happened because he had the foresight to plan ahead. And they told him, "You told us you don't like history books and you don't like talking about the past, except that's all you do anymore. All you, all you do is stay in your trauma loop." You know, which is not, wasn't like not, at all. It's not making you happy and it's not what you even want to be doing. So listen to us, come over here and we'll help you. So um, I guess it's easier said than done, but at least he, he was cooperating and getting better every day. Yeah. And that's good. And it's a beautiful lesson for the rest of us. Yes. Don't you know? stay, don't stay in a, in a trauma loop if you can help it. Do what you I, can. It's hard, but yeah, try, try to, try to get somebody to help you with it and don't get discouraged. Keep trying. It's true. You can make new tracks in the brain. I, I know that. It's with positive thinking and just changing it up. Do it different. Instead of using the red cup that you use for your coffee every day, start using the green one. Well, and, it's, and, it, and if your trauma loop involves the death of someone, yes, um, I hope that my book can help. Because I whoever that too. person is who died, and maybe you witnessed a, a, a terrible thing, mm -hmm. uh, they will have survived. And this is yeah, what's so great. Doesn't off anybody. Yes, and and this is what's so great about bringing these other souls that want to come back in and help. I just think it's amazing. We've got two other people. Bridget is another one. Um, what is she's dead but not bouncing? What bouncing? Uh, 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 not dead, just bouncy. Not dead, just bouncy. So tell us what Brid Bridget's bringing to the table. Yeah, she, this is another. Uh, she also died falling out of a tree when she was ten or about ten. She was, she, in her afterlife, she was in, she showed me a place where everybody in it was, um, had died in falls. Uh, and again, it was not a happy place, not a punishment, just a kind of a bland uh, place where everybody had fallen. Uh -huh. And she was told that someone came up to her and said, do you see that person over there? Uh, would you go over and talk to her? Would you go sit by her? Kind of mm -hmm. like pure ministry, I would call it. 
Yeah. Uh, people helping people, sort of like the way the AA movement is structured. Yes, I agree. It's not a bunch of psychologists, it's a bunch of, of alcoholics that, mm-hmm. that, that help each other. Yeah. Well, yes. she was in a place where she was pulled into the healing of other people. She got good at it, and they told her she was good at it. And then mm. she, they told her, you're sort of a blend of, a, of a, a wise child. You know, for your age, you really seem mature, and you're really mm. good at this. Would you keep doing it? So they kept giving her children, especially who had fallen and felt broken and sad. And she told them, well, look, your body isn't anything that breaks or leaks anymore. Isn't that great? Even if you did fall, there's nothing to break and there's nothing that will leak. And then she, and then she decided kids like to, to fall sometimes as long as they don't break. <laughs> and so she said, you know, at, at, at parties, at birthday parties, lots of times there's a bouncy house where kids just bounce up and down and fall down and laugh. Yes. Trampolines where they do the same thing. And she said, I just tell them they're not dead. They're just bouncy. Yeah. Isn't she the one that said, um, I'm, you're not, you're, it's just a death. I'm, it's something. She, she said, yeah. She said, everybody dies of something. It's just, uh, it's just we, a death. It's just death. See, and this is the thing that they do. And what I've gotten over and over again by reading all of these stories is the mm-hmm. fact that they, they keep it simple. Even though it's very hard, a lot of the little things that they say are all things that we deal with over here. And the information that they give us on their plane works on this one as well. Yes. It's, it's pretty simple. People you know, people. We've, we've got this other gentleman that um, you and I've talked about, the sheriff, that has definitely an anger management prob- problem. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I really want his story in there because sometimes it can, it, it, they can all sound like they went through these horrible things, but they're so peaceful. Well, the it sheriff. Sounds like, he sounds like nobody. Like, a, sorry to interrupt you, Father Nathan, but like a, a typical guy who's trying to protect his family, and and something really bad happened, and some really bad words were there, and so he went in with gangbusters. He was he got, in a small town department. He was the chief. Yep. And then he, had, on a normal day, a, a, the ghost of his sister, who was alive, showed up, and he said, "I've never had anything like that happen in my life. I could wow. see her plain as day. She was right in front of me." But she was she was agitated, and I I felt I knew I had to get to her house and find out what was wrong. Wow. He was in her, he approached her house, but he thought he was going on a wellness check that maybe she had fallen or something. Uh, and he just let his guard down. He wasn't thinking that it could be a violent scene. He just yeah. thought maybe she had had a health emergency. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was in her front yard when he heard shots and three men he didn't know running out of her house calling her a bitch. Yes. One of them, he recognized that one had a gun in his hand, and he said, I didn't shoot for his arm or his leg. I shot for his torso, and I killed him. And he said, but I didn't count on the scrawny one next to him who had some sort of mail-order internet uh, gun that was white. Yes. Made of and, plastic, I think. And Catherine said she, she said she knew about that kind of a gun. I mean, it just looked like a toy gun, but it was... It, it had shot a real bullet, and he yep. said... He said it went through me and did me in. So there were three deaths that day, his sister, he, and the man that shot his sister. And he was furious. And he was disappointed in himself because he was supposed to keep the town safe. And his sister got murdered. Yeah, he didn't save her. And he didn't save her. And he said that his problem in the afterlife was that his anger was so hot. He said it was like they, they compared it to high blood pressure. You're like a time bomb. We can't let you stay this way. You can't stay this angry. Uh, he said they, they created something like a mash unit for me. Uh, yes. That was, uh, but that it was temporary. And they kept telling me, you'll move as soon as we can get your uh, numbers down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was not they a happy camper. The time. You didn't even know you had these numbers in your body until some machine tells you <laughs> you've got this, that, or the other thing they're measuring. And then he compared himself to a steak. Remember that? Yes. Uh, like, uh, I, was, I was too hot, and they said I needed to be pink in the center. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> they they can get me cooler. Yes. And, and they finally got him down to, he said, to the decimal point. And they said, as soon as I got there, I, I, I pushed to uh, be allowed to cross. And they said, well, you just barely qualify, and uh, we're not letting you in that man so that you can go on a rampage. You have to promise us, you, you took an oath 
that you would protect and serve. And you may not go into Father Nathan and and uh, go all angry. Get, go yes. The rampage. You Father have Nathan doesn't need that. Know. Well, that's the thing, too, with you. The people, you have your people keep their emotions down. So you don't have to feel all that, right? I've been a priest, you know, for 35 years, and I am I am not a good shoulder to cry on. I have a lot of competencies, Nina, but if you need a shoulder to cry on, go somewhere else. Yes. Okay. I am not that guy. Well, you're the man for the job, though, in helping these stuck people then. Yeah, but but I've made it known in the universe, you know, don't send crying people into crying in me. Get get their tears out of them before they come into me. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. There's a place for me. You know, the universe is a big place, and somehow I, I provide a service. But anyway, this guy and this and the sheriff said, I know simple, some people forgive their murderer with their dying breath, but not me. Uh, that little guy was an idiot. And uh, I suppose I'll think about forgiving him sometime, but I'm not. In, he said, I'm not. I'm barely at the starting gate of that. And so what I loved reading about the sheriff was the fact that he was allowed to be mad. Yes. You know, it, it was it was bad what happened. And and they were giving him that space to be mad and to be angry about it, but yet saying, you know, and it's what I tell people here, you know, you can be angry, but don't stay there for very long. Just get it out, do what you got to do and move the, you know, what on. Yes. And he pretty much said that he said, I know uh, he said, um, uh, I, I know grudge holding won't help me, but that's what I want to do for right now. Yes. Yes. And, they, and uh, so uh, he made a mental note. And I, that's, we were talking a little earlier in the show about everybody has stuff to do. Yes. And on your kind of long life story to do list, there might be some reconciliation or some acknowledging some th- unhappy thing that you mm-hmm. didn't do or telling the truth about something that you've lied to yourself about. Yes. Uh, and some of them are saying, well, I don't think I have very much to tell your readers except. Whatever they're avoiding doing, do it. Wow. Not enough right there. Yeah. You know, and that the freedom is over there. There's freedom. There's freedom. I mean, today, let's, just between the sheriff being angry, two people falling out of a tree, and Naughty being shot by a little girl and then being able to forgive her because she had a gun to her head, that's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. And all of them, all, all of them gave us these very simple little phrases and and little what I call nuggets of wisdom to just take with you in your life and your new book looks like it's shaping up real well father Nathan and I'm I'm super excited about it and um, I'm feeling good about it it's hard to start a book you know I know I Uh, know but you're definitely getting there you really are and this the content that I've read this week I've been just reading so much and it's all good and it helps me so I, I know that it's going to be good and we'll touch on more. We're coming to a close on the show here and we will we'll be touching on more when you're on next week. Is there anything? Oh, we next, mean next month. I mean, next month. In, yeah, um, I just want people to know they can find me on my website, nathan-castle.com. Yes. Uh, and if they want to email me up in the, you know, the upper uh, left-hand corner, there's one of those little email things, info it. Yeah. Uh, so if they, and, um, then I've also got a video series out that I'd be happy to share with people. And uh, you and I are both discounting our services because a lot of people are, you know, yes. out of work or whatever. And so uh, if they can't afford the video series, all they need to do is let me know that and we'll work something out. Fantastic. And this was just such a great show today. And I do encourage you to reach out to Father Nathan. He's got a lot of great resources and I read all of his stuff. I've done all of his webinars and it's, it's just all so and very, very interesting. You're very so kind. <laughs> thank you, Father Nathan, and thanks for coming on today. And uh, you take care and have a oh, good rest of your trip up there on your retreat. Okay, God bless you. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining Inspiring End of Life Conversations. It was such a great show today. So very interesting to be with Father Nathan again. He is on the third Wednesday of every month. And um, I guess I'll be seeing you next week. So take care. Thanks for listening and God bless you. Bye-bye. We hope you have found hope in this week's edition of Inspiring End of Life Conversations. 
Please join your host, Nina Impala, for another program next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time and 3 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We'll talk again soon.